Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm with the program committee. I have the pleasure of introducing Murray Steele today, um, engineering manager by day, co-organizer of the London R Ruby user group by night. Murray cares about encouraging a sense of curiosity and play while programming. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Murray. Thanks for coming to my talk. I'm an engineering manager at Clio. We're based in the UK, but our customers are in the US. We're empowering people to build a life beyond a paycheck. And we do that with an AI assistant that understands your banking information in order to give you personalized and relevant advice on your personal finances. And for a fee, access to a range of services to actively help you improve your situation. But I'm not talking about anything related to that today. But if it sounds interesting, we are hiring and we can help with visas and relocations, so come and find me later. I have this face. You'll find me. What I am here to talk to you about is files and data, and let's just get started. So here's a screenshot of a fairly standard downloads folder. All these different types of files, pictures, movies, documents, audio. The file names include the title of the file and after the dot, what's known as a file extension that tells you what kind of file it is. In a modern graphical operating system, you don't have to parse that extension yourself. Your OS does it and gives you a handy icon to tell you what the file is, and maybe even a hint as to what application will be used to open the file if you double click it. Indeed, if you rename the file to change the extension, this will very likely change the icon and the application that will open it. Your OS might even warn you about that. When I first started using computers, I thought this was all that was involved. Rename the file and you'll be able to use it. Of course, it's not. When I tried renaming a file from .doc to .txt, I didn't have Microsoft Word at the time, I couldn't open to the file to read it in Notepad. It was just a stream of nonsense. I did try the example in the screenshot. I hoped that if I renamed a PDF to a WAV, it would magically be able to read all the words in the PDF out to me. Obviously, it didn't. It just gave me an error. So there's more to it than just the file extension. What, what's going on? On Unix systems, there's a command called file that if you give it a file, it will tell you, do its best to tell you what that file actually is. So sort of interestingly, one of the things it does is open the file and take a look at some of it to, to have a guess. It doesn't just take the name of the file on blind faith and say that, yeah, this is a text file if it really is a zip file. So going back to my youthful attempts to open files without the relevant, usually expensive software, this explains why it didn't work. You can call your file whatever you want, and the OS may use that for some hints as to what application will open the file, but it's what's actually inside the file that really matters. Renaming a doc to a TXT won't let you get at the words inside it. Renaming a PDF to a WAV won't let you listen to the contents of that PDF file. I'm wiser now, and I understand my youthful folly, but at some point in my, my early terminally online life, I came across a website that described the data structure for WAV files. WAV files, if you don't know, are simple, uncompressed sound files storing like a digital representation of a recording of an actual sound. The ones and zeros of the data are the numerical values that represent the sound wave, hence the name. And they are very simple. They're made up of a header part and a data part. The data part is just that. It's raw bytes that represent the digital representation of the sound wave. Just a stream of numbers, really. There's lots of different ways to interpret those numbers, and that's what the header part does. It tells us how to interpret the data. The header part is split in two. The first part tells the world, hi, I'm a WAV file, and I'm this long. Uh, it's very short and is there basically to tell the other software, if you don't know what a WAV file is, you can stop now. Um, that's definitely the voice of a WAV file. <laughs> uh, the second part tells the audio software how to interpret the data that follows. Things like how many channels, is it mono or stereo? How many samples there are per second for the sound? How many bits there are per sample? How detailed this data is, more channels, more samples per second, more bits per sample, means the sound is more accurate but you need much more data to represent the same length of sound. Okay, so we can't rename a file from taxreturn.pdf to taxreturn.wav and expect to be able to listen to it, but 
given how simple the WAV file format is, we could take a PDF file and put a WAV file header on top of it, and then we can listen to it. How? Well, a WAV file is header and data, and the data bit's easy. We just take the entire contents of the PDF and smoosh it onto the bottom of our WAV file. We can then calculate what we need for the header just by looking at the size of our source file. And making some choices about the sample rate and bits per sample, we can calculate the second half of the header. So here's some Ruby code that constructs the header. Let's go through it. This first stanza builds the whole of the identifier and length part of the header. E.g., I'm a WAV file and I'm this big, including the size of the header. That's the magic 36. The second stanza constructs the first part of the, the data header. Um, it, our arbitrary choices here are the uh, instance variables, like what the sample rate is and bits per sample will be. And we combine those with some calculations on the file size to explain how to interpret our data. There's some more magic numbers in here too, but trust me, while they're important, they're also boring. The third stanza constructs the final part of the, the inter data interpretation, which again uses the file size to explain how much data there is. As we saw, after this header, we just have the raw bytes that make up the actual sound data. So what's missing from this code snippet is how you actually copy the data around between files, and I'm sure you could all just imagine that, so I'm not gonna show it. All that's really interesting about this code, I think, is the pack method. I don't know about you, but in my day-to-day -day coding life, I'd never encountered it before, so this is what pack does. Called on an array of numbers and passed a format string, pack will convert those integers into bytes. Now, why is that interesting? Aren't numbers bytes anyway? Well, it turns out there's lots of different ways to represent a number in bytes, and pack lets you control that. So you can say, represent this number as a four-byte number, or represent it as a two-byte big endian number, or a two-byte signed integer. You don't need to know what those words mean, but trust me, it's, it's important when you're thinking about bytes. What a WAV file cares about is that some of the header is a four-byte number, and some of, the, some of it is a two-byte number. And that's what these pack statements are doing. It's a big V for a four-byte big endian, and it's a little V for a two-byte big endian. And that's basically all there is to it. As an aside, that code had a lot of magic numbers in it. At work, we've got a custom Rubocop rule published as a gem that shouts at us if we've had any magic numbers in our code and tells, go and define a named constant for it. But this code is personal and for fun, so best practices be damned, right? That said, coming back to this code, I did wonder what that 16 was. Is the 16 special because we're talking about bytes and it's a multiple of eight? Or is it something about the WAV file format? I, I, I don't remember, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, if I'd given it a name, maybe I would. So like best practices are good, actually. <laughs> anyway, we've seen all that code, so why don't we, why don't we try it out? So first we will require my library. It's called Stegosaurus because I kind of thought this code might be, have I spelled Stegosaurus properly? Yes. Um, I thought this code might be like a steganography tool, hiding data within other data. And also um, dinosaurs are cool. So um, we've got a library called Stegosaurus. We can grab an object from it. It's a wave object because we're building wave files. Um, we can make a wave file from a file. Um, we're going to need a file. I've got a readme in the repo. It's about a thousand bytes. That should give us something interesting, right? So we will do that. Oh, I need to capture the. And then I've got a convenient. Convenient little helper method to let me open this file. Okay, it's very short. <laughs> As I said, um, the like, WAV file format really needs a lot of data to get you to hear something. So we're gonna need a bigger file. Um, there are probably bigger files lying around, but the, the big file I know that I definitely have is the Ruby interpreter itself. So Ruby comes with this lo nice little module called rbconfig which um, has lots of details about like, how Ruby was built. But the important method that I care about is rbconfig.ruby, which gives you the path to the currently running Ruby interpreter. So if we stick that 
uh, into our um, oh my goodness never do live demos if we stick that in there we'll be able to hear the Ruby interpreter itself as a WAV file um, I hope I hope you're ready for this what Oh, never do live demos. Okay, I hope you're ready for this. Yeah, so it's, it, I mean, it's basically unlistenable white noise, right? Fair, what did we expect? Um, but what, what is kind of interesting and, and is as we skip through it, That's probably enough. Um, there's, there's some structure there, like different parts of the file sound different. Um, if you're old and dusty like me, you can thank me later for the nostalgia trip you just had about loading software from tapes or dialing into the internet over, over, over a telephone. Um, cool, so that was kind of interesting. You don't want to listen to it, but it's interesting. And there was some structure there. So we explored the WAV file a bit and there was some structure, I think that's interesting. I'm not going to listen to all that white noise, though, and, and get attuned to the differences. So what if there's another way to explore the structure of the file? A, a visual way, maybe? If we can listen to our files as WAVs, is there a similar shape format to let us look at them, too? Yes, there is. Um, there's the BMP image format, um, bitmaps. It's got a header and then pixel data, so we should be able to do basically the same as we did with WAV files, calculate the header and write out our source file as the image. If you look at it in a bit more detail, yeah, header and data. The data, as you might expect, is the pixel data. It's color values for each pixel in the image. Um, the header can be split into three parts. There's an opening segment with the BMP identifier and the length of the file. There's a second segment that includes information about how to interpret the pixels, so like the width and height, the color depth, um, DPI resolution if you want to print these bitmaps out to um, like inches. And there's a final segment that describes the colors used in the image. Bitmap is an indexed color, so we, the pixels are not red, green, blue values, they're a number into the color table. It's nothing we've not done before with WAV files, except the pixel data part is a little more complex. We can't just throw all the data at the end of the header and expect it to work. There's three problems that we have to solve. The first one is color depth. How many colors does the image have? One of the arbitrary choices we make is to choose a color depth, and that has an impact on the amount of data we need. If we want a monochrome image, we choose one bit color depth, and each byte of our file is equal to eight whole pixels. So a 25 byte file becomes a 200 byte a 200 pixel image. If we want more color, 256 to be exact, um, shout out to VGA, um, we can choose 8 bit color, so one byte, one pixel, 25 byte file, 25 pixel image. What if we want even more colors? We could choose 24 bit color, um, true color, 16 million colors, like your eyes will not be able to cope with that. Um, our 25 byte file is now a glorious 8 and 1 third pixels. If we don't have a complete pixel, a bitmap renderer is just not going to show the image. So what do we do? Pretty easy. Unlike any other programming problem, it is null to the rescue. <laughs> so we just add null bytes to the end of the file, uh, at the end of the data. We can work out how many whole pixels the data would create and how many padding bytes we need to complete that last pixel. Just a function of the file size and the color depth. Problem solved. The second problem is one of rectangles, width and height. Images have to be rectangles, so we need to arrange our pixels into rectangles. Our padding example is really simple. We've got a 25 byte file, which we pad to um, nine pixels. Nine pixels is a lovely three by three square. Easy. It's not always that simple. What if it's a 28 byte file? That gives us 10 pixels. Yes, you can rearrange that into a five by two rectangle, but factoring huge file sizes to find convenient rectangles that will also be reasonable to look at on a screen might be painful. We don't want wide and short or tall and skinny images. Simplest thing is just to work with squares. So it is null to the rescue again, hurrah. 
Um, we have a simple algorithm for calculating the smallest square that contain all our pixels. We get the number of pixels, 10. We take the square root, 3 point something. Uh, we round that up, 4. We square it, 16. We subtract the number of pixels that you have, 16 minus 10, 6. So we have to stick 6 padding pixels onto the bottom of our image, and now we've got a square. It might be inefficient of extra bytes, but it is easy. This is like two or three methods off math. Our third problem is scan lines. Now, you could probably have anticipated the first two if you thought about the problem of like images, but scan lines are a quirk of the bitmap format. A scan line is a single row of pixels from our image, so our 28-byte file, 16-pixel images, is four by four. So it has four scan lines containing four pixels each. For reasons, the bitmap spec says a scan line must be a multiple of four bytes. So this is fine for our 28-byte file because our rows are four pixels long. Each <coughs> pixel is three bytes, and that adds up to 12, which is a multiple of four. But if we go back to our 25-byte file, that's nine pixels, a three by three square, which is nine bytes per scan line, which is not a multiple of four. So happily, it is also null to the rescue again, but we could rearrange the pixel data to make scan lines that are four bytes long, and then we pad the end of that file with null bytes, and this will work, valid scan lines. However, I kind of think we've wasted some of our data. If we look at it as bytes and pixels, you might see what I mean. Um, when I rearranged the pixels into valid scan lines, some of those pixels aren't actually pixels. They're not visible. The, they're just there to appease the scan line rules. We can't see those pixels. Um, if I overlay like a visible overlay onto this, um, you'll see what I mean. Those pixels at the end, those bytes at the end, are just there to appease the scan line rule. And it annoys me that six whole bytes of my data file are being stuck on at the end and I can't see them. So they're not showing me the structure of the file. So I, I gave myself a self-imposed rule. I don't want to waste any source file bytes. It's my project and I can do what I want, even if it creates problems to solve, which I guess, like, that's why we're all here, solve problems with programming, even if they're self-imposed and silly. I want to use as much data from my file as possible to make my image, so we're going to have to rethink. Instead of adding null bytes to the end, what if we add null bytes Instead of them adding them to the end of the file, what if we add them to the end of the scan lines? So, yeah, this gives me valid scan lines of 12 bytes, which is good. And we've not wasted any bytes, which is also good. So that's that problem solved. To recap quickly, um, here's all the padding we need for a single file. 24-bit color, 17-byte file. Arranged in groups of three bytes. That gives us five complete pixels and two bytes left over. So we add one null byte to complete the last pixel, giving us six pixels. That's not a square, annoyingly. So we add three pixels to get a nine pixel square. These new pixels are made up of three null bytes each, so we're adding another nine bytes. Another, yeah. Our nine pixel square image means we have three rows of three pixels each. I've read that already. No, I haven't. Our nine pixel square image means we have three rows of three pixels each, which is nine bytes, so we add three bytes per line to get our multiple of four. This completes our scan lines. Total padding, 19 bytes. Yes, that's more than the original source file, which is inefficient, but like this is an extreme example because of the small input file. You probably don't have any 17 bytes files on your, on your computer these days. They're all huge, right? Um, What's interesting about this is we can see that pixel and rectangle padding just go to the end of the source data, but the line padding has to go inside the source data at the end of each line. So I said the code for, um, for WAV, for writing the source data, was uninteresting, but it's not for bitmap, so here's a little snippet. We pull pixels from the file based on how wide the image will be in pixels. We pull bytes from the file <laughs> based on how wide it will be in, in, in pixels, and then we write them to the target file. And then we add the scan line padding bytes, and then we repeat this until we've exhausted the, the file. 
what's most interesting here is our um, top line where we construct the scan line padding. Our friend Pack is back, but we're packing from an empty array. What's, what's going on there? Well, it turns out if you want null bytes, you can create an array of the right number of zeros and pack with the appropriate command string, depending on how many bytes you want that zero to take up. Or you can just use an X. And if you use an X with a number followed after it, it'll generate that many null bytes. And it doesn't use up any of the numbers in your array. Here, we only want null bytes, so we can pack on an empty array. We're getting something from nothing. That's neat. As another aside, there's a whole lot more that Pack can do, but spoilers, this was our last outing in this talk. To learn more, I recommend this post on, the, on Jan Lellis's uh, idiosyncratic Ruby blog. Um, the whole blog is great, though. Thanks, Jan. I don't think you're in the room, but thank you. Um, you should go and read that. So there's a lot more code in this one, but mostly it's uninteresting. As you can imagine, the code for dealing with all the other padding we calculated is a load of maths. But you can probably imagine it. Um, there's also code to generate a color table as four byte tuples. And although a critical reading of this code would be interesting, why have I used so many while loops? Why isn't bytes from more idiomatic and iterator based? I don't know. We're not going to find out. <laughs> so to save me from critical self-reflection on that code, let's have a demo and see what our data looks like. Cool. Okay, so as before, we're going to grab an object. So we have a generator called bumps. We will do the same thing. We'll generate something from, no, 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 no. Generate from the readme again. Okay, right, if this is working properly. That is tiny, but let's look inside. So there's our image, right? That's, that's a bitmap generated from our readme. The interesting thing you can see here is like at the top, the color sort of stops halfway through. Those are our null bytes. Bitmaps are upside down. That's absolutely wild. Thanks, bitmap people. Um, <laughs> You don't get much from a short readme file, do you? But one of the arbitrary choices we can make, oh, bring the terminal to the front. One of the arbitrary choices we can make is the bit count, or the color depth. So why don't we generate a one bit version And that is maybe a bit more interesting. Let me just zoom in on it. So you can see there's a bit more structure here. You could probably learn to read this just like that guy in the first Matrix movie. And then this could be how you operate with computers, right? That would be fun. Um, yeah, there's, there's some structure there. That's interesting. OK. Um, but I know what you want. You want to see Ruby as a bitmap. Come out with you. Yeah, you want to see Ruby as a bitmap, and I will make that happen. So, what might Ruby the bitmap look like? An error. Oh, it literally is an error. Oh no. Right. Luckily, I think I have this file somewhere. I mean, I know. Oh. Live demos. You have to trust me that I did, in fact, generate this live before. Where's the, here we go. No, we don't want, we don't want to zoom in on that. Okay, so here's Ruby. This is, this is um, Ruby, the, uh, the bitmap. Um, what can we learn from this? Um, well, bits of it are pink which is cool because it's Ruby, so that's good. Um, a surprising amount of it is this iridescent green, 
which, um, as we all know, there was some pearl influence on Ruby, as Matt shared this morning. So, so that's probably what that is. That's all the pearl stuff. And then there's this sort of scary dark bit in the like, top third. I, I guess that's maybe where the exceptions live. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, I, I can't interpret this, but we can look at this and we can um, make up stories to describe what we don't know, just like our ancestors did. That's, that's fun. That's fun, right? Um, Cool, so we, we've, we've looked at bitmaps and seen some things. Let me just get rid of that. Get the terminal back. Hmm, sad that that didn't work. Okay. The thing about that was it was sort of a diversion from my original plan. I want to hear files. And while waves worked, even the most hardened glitch core music fan probably wouldn't enjoy listening to them for more than less than a second. Luckily, there's another file format to play around with. MIDI. So MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And the file format is part of a standard for communicating with actual hardware instruments like synthesizers and so on. And the part that's interesting to me is that as a file format, instead of storing the actual recorded sound like a wave, it's more akin to sheet music. And as a format, it's header and database, so we can work our magic with it too. So, what does a MIDI file look like? It's the header and data that we know and love. The header contains two parts, an identifier that says I'm a MIDI file, and it explains some details about what type of MIDI file am I, and things like time signatures. And then there's a track header that explains the size of the track data to come. The track data, however, it's not like WAV, it's not just smoosh a source file under here and we're done. And it's not like bitmap where we have to interpret and interleave some padding. It's more structured. It's actually made up of a stream of MIDI events. So a MIDI event is structured. What does it look like? So it's made up of time and data. Um, delta time, this says when the event should occur. It's known as delta time because it's the time since the previous event. So rather than a fixed at this point in the song value, it can be between one and four bytes. The event data says what the event actually is and can also be broken into two parts. We have the type, there's a list of event types, uh, play a note, set the tempo, do something with the hardware. This is always one byte. And then the data contains extra data depending on the event. So playing a note means data on which note. Um, it's one or two bytes depending on the type. Let's look at those three parts in some more detail. So delta time's interesting. It's stored as a variable length value of between one and four bytes. It's a space saving technique. A piece of music could have, uh, I don't know, like 200 notes in it. If you're always storing four bytes for the information, that would be 800 bytes. That's ostentatious. For most notes, you probably don't need a four byte value to say, play this note really soon after the last note. So if you could store that value in a one byte number, you'd save like 600 bytes. That's amazing. How, is this, how this is implemented is that a single byte is split into two parts. You have seven bits used to store the value. And the remaining one bit is used to say if the next byte contains more data for the value or not. Zero means no more data, you've got all the information you need. One means read the next byte and find out. Values less than 128 can be stored in one byte. Values more than 128 are stored in multiple bytes. In theory, this allows for infinitely large values as we can keep setting the more bit to one. In practice, the MIDI spec says four bytes is the maximum. This gives us 28 bits in which to store a value, allowing us to store values from zero to like 268 million. This should be enough for even the longest of long songs. So here's a quick worked example. Where's my mouse pointer? Where's my mouse pointer? Oh, here it is. So a value like 127, it's encoded in bits as a, in one byte as a zero followed by seven ones. To encode in um, VLQ, variable length quantity, it's the same. But that first zero isn't a padding zero that we don't care about. It's a status bit saying, this value is complete. You don't need to read another byte. 
A value like 128 is encoded in bits as one byte followed by seven zeros. To encode in VLQ, we need two bytes. The first byte is a one followed by six zeros, then a one. That first one means read another byte. That other byte is eight zeros, the first zero of which is the status bit saying, this value is complete and you don't need to read more data. So how does that turn back into a value of 128? Well, we can drop the two status bits, they're uninteresting. That gives us six zeros, a one, seven zeros. And those leading six zeros are uninteresting to us as well. And that gives us eight bits, a one followed by seven zeros. And where have we seen that before? Oh yeah, it's the standard bit encoding of 128. So that's variable length quantity encoding. You may recognize this kind of encoding if you've ever dealt with UTF-8. It is also a variable length encoding uh, quant thing about how a character can be stored as one, two, three, or four bytes. Not this exact encoding, but those MIDI spec designers were onto something. So, event types. This is stored in a single byte, but we only have seven bits to store the type value because the first bit must be a one. There are lots of event types, which can be broken into four categories. MIDI things that I do understand, but don't care about, like lyrics or copyright information. MIDI things I don't understand, like ports and resetting. Music things I don't understand, like te temp tempo or pitch bending. Or music things I do understand and care about. There are exactly two of these. Turn this note on, turn this note off. It is one zero 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 four extra bits for turn this note on turn this note off, or 1001, four extra bits for turn this note on. The remaining four bits of the type contain the channel number in which to play this note or stop it. MIDI has 16 channels and a value between zero and 15 fits in a four bit number. So that's convenient. A channel is kind of like an instrument. It's not really, but for our purposes, we can think of it like that. If we think about the event data, it's also stored in a single byte and we also only have seven bits to store the type value because the first bit must be a zero. Yes, this means we can easily tell the difference between a type byte and a data byte, which is probably useful for reading files and bailing immediately on corrupt data. Our note events both take two bytes of data, one for the key and one for the velocity. Key is literally which key, um, note to play. For example, uh, middle C, a popular note, I believe, is note number 60. Uh, which is not quite the middle between zero and 127, but whatever, music nerds. Velocity is how hard the note is played, sometimes known as attack. Um, think of it like a numerical value for how soft or hard you pressed the key on a piano or took your hands off the key on the piano. Other events take different data that mean different things, but all stored in one or two bytes. So if we put it all together, what do we need to store one of our note on or note off events? Well, we need a delta time, a type, on or off, a key, and velocity. And that looks like this, a byte that starts zero, a byte that starts one, zero, zero, and then two bytes that start zero. Or because delta time can be two bytes, it could be a one byte, a zero byte, a 100 byte, and two zero bytes, or three, or four. There's no five because delta time is one to four bytes. Hopefully you can kind of see the problem that we're getting here. It's very unlikely that our source data file is gonna have its bytes arranged so that the first bit, bits, magically adhere to this structure. So we can use our source data to fill in the orange parts of this diagram, and we can statically add the blue parts. Our solution is to deal with the bits within the source file, not the bytes we need 27 bits of data from the source file to make one MIDI event. Eight bits to um, extract the delta time using variable length encoding. This will be turned into either one or two bytes. I could use 28 bits as that's the maximum allowed in a four byte value, but it might also mean pausing for hours between notes. That won't be fun to listen to. I could use seven bits so it always fits into one byte, but. I didn't learn about VLQ not to use it. So eight bits seems like an arbitrary, but good choice. And then we need one bit to decide if it's on or off, um, four bits to say which channel, seven bits for the key, seven bits for how hard, fast, soft the note is played. 
This way, we can use all the data from our source file and be sure that it's going to be arranged correctly for making valid MIDI data. And here's the code to do just that. First, we read 27 bytes from the source file and we pad it with zeros if there aren't 27 bytes available, like end of the file. Why 27 bytes? Murray, you said we needed 27 bits. Well, the problem is file reading APIs are byte scale, not bit scale. 27 bytes is 216 bits. Turns out there's no smaller common factor of 27, the number of bits we want per event, and eight, the smallest number of bits we can read at a time. So we read 27 bytes, and that lets us create eight MIDI events using 27 bits at a time. I told you earlier I didn't like messing with factoring. We turn those bytes into a string of their binary representation using sprintf. The percent %08b format string says, turn this number into a zero padded binary number of eight characters long. We use sprintf because although we can get binary representation with 2s passing in the base, two, it won't give us the zero padding at the front. So it won't be eight characters long and we need all of those bits. So then we, we do that. We join them all together as one long 216 character string of ones and zeros, turn that into an array. Then we can loop eight times through it to pull out the chunks of 27 bits as we outlined before. Eight for the delta time, one for the on or off, four for the channel, seven for the key, seven for the velocity. And then we turn all those bits into the valid bytes we need with VLQ encoding for the time and the static 100s and zeros at the front of the uh, event type and data bytes. The 2i with a 2 is the inverse of the 2s with a 2. It says take this string, interpret it as a binary number and turn it into a real number. Binary numbers are real, what are you talking about, Murray? We put all of these numbers into an array and uh, oh, it's you again, pack. Didn't I say we were done? Anyway, then we pack the whole array as a one byte character data and we can write that to our file. So now we have unsophisticated but valid MIDI data generated from arbitrary file data. Let's do a demo. Hope this one goes better. Right. Uh, let's clear the screen. So, you know the routine by now. We have an object from Stegosaurus called Midriffs this time. Make from the readme, and we pass it to the helper function. And I'm opening this in an app called MIDI Trail that will let me play the MIDI file, but will also show it as a keyboard traveling along a road of notes in space. Because, because why not? So let's listen to this, the orchestral score of my README. That's pretty fun. That's pretty fun, right? Um, bit short. I, I know what you all want. You want Ruby, the orchestral score. So, I hope you are ready for this. So it takes a while because it's not very efficient. <laughs> All of that um, bit and byte stuff, turning them into strings and arrays, takes a while. Okay, that's uh, it's quite a lot longer. <laughs> Let's see, we can pan around in here, can we? Where's the keyboard? No, oh, not even. Yeah, that's quite the space road of notes. Should we listen to it? I assume we might want this for some like parties later. It's pretty good. I mean, it goes on for like an hour. So, um, ah. I, I get it. You're probably thinking, why? Um, so let's start with the easy answer, why Ruby? We don't normally do this kind of thing in a language like Ruby. Bit and byte manipulation is pretty unwieldy. Shouldn't you be using C? Probably, but Ruby is the language I know best. 
and I was able to get really fast feedback using Ruby. It didn't stop me breaking it this morning, apparently. But, um, and that feels important to me when I'm playing about with these kinds of toys and silly ideas. And that's really my point here. Pick a tool you know and are comfortable with in order to learn something new. If, like me, you're learning all about bit and byte manipulation and file formats, best not also to be learning a new programming language at the same time. Of course, the flip side to that, if you are learning a new programming language, solve a problem that you've already solved and learn how to do it in the new programming language. And I'll let you into a little secret. That's exactly what I did with this code. The first version of this WAV file generator I wrote in 2004 when I was a Python programmer. In 2007, I became a Ruby programmer and I decided to port my little thing over to Ruby to try and learn some idioms. Um, it's a good job we glided over the bitmap generator because I didn't learn very many Ruby idioms when I did it. Um, but yeah. So more existentially, why this? Why this actual thing? It is, let's face it, a pointless little toy and why have I eaten 44 minutes right now of your life telling you about it? I guess I made it because I was curious and I thought it would be fun. We don't often get to combine those two traits at work and that's what I want to encourage by sharing my story. Day-to-day -day work can be boring, S samey. A friend boiled down a lot of what we do to putting strings in a database and taking strings out of a database. And I'm not saying work can't be exciting or challenging or mentally stimulating, it, it, it often is. But an important part of a project like this, for me, is the freedom and fun of it all. I'm not making trade-offs about user value in tech debt. I'm not following a roadmap or caring about best practices. I'm just exploring something that's interesting to me and making choices of what to build based on the whim of it. Maybe you're lucky and the itches you want to scratch are exactly the ones you get to scratch at work. But programming computers is amazing. We can make them do anything with just a few lines of letters, numbers, and too much punctuation. I refuse to believe that you have nothing outside the limited scope of your job that you'd want to make a computer do. I encourage you to embrace that and go and explore some idea that's fun to you. Now, I am categorically not saying, have passion for coding, fill your evenings and weekends with coding. You can do this in your nine to five. Think about how you could embrace curiosity and fun in your day-to-day -day work. What are the opportunities to follow your whims? Look for those or make them up yourself. I shared the Rubicop magic numbers gem, not just to shoehorn a work reference in to justify them paying for the trip. Thank you, Cleo. Um, but because it was built by a colleague who wanted to play with Rubicop's AST stuff and managed to fit that into a day-to-day -day work in a way that would be useful to the rest of us. So, maybe you'll learn something useful for work. I learned about um, space-saving encoding techniques and bit and byte manipulation, which could come in handy if I ever do embedded systems work. Maybe your side projects can spin out into a livelihood. I will happily DJ your wedding with a custom orchestral score made from your personal data. Maybe your side projects will even be useful at work, like a new Rubocop gem to encourage best practices. But those shouldn't be the only reason to do something. This isn't about work, it's about play. All the code lives here if you want to play with it. I'll try and fix it so that it will work. Um, it won't hold up to a critical reading. Every time I come back to it, I find more bugs and put more in, apparently. Um, I said it was a it might be a steganography tool. It's not because I wasn't interested in writing the reconstruction routines that Bitmap and MIDI um, forced me to do because this was for fun and that didn't interest me. Thanks for listening. Bye.